Hey, it's Liz Alto, and this is the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. From body image, sex, spirituality, money and relationships, to motherhood, creativity, business, communication and desire, Untame the Wild Soul Woman is the place to come for real stories and powerful advice to help you reclaim and redefine womanhood in the 21st century. Elizabeth D'Alto here with a quick announcement and special invitation for you before we get into today's episode. If you've been listening to the podcast for the past several weeks, you've heard me mention that I am currently filling a six-month mentorship that'll start in January and run through June in 2016. It's called the Untame Yourself Women's Leadership Council, and I just wanted to take a moment before the show today to give you a little more information in case you've been thinking about applying, wondering if you should apply, and would like to know, is this something that you could personally benefit from in 2016? So to give you an idea of the type of women that are applying and what women really seem to have in common is a lot of transitions. I'm getting a lot of women applying for the mentorship who are either transitioning in careers, in relationships, or going through transitions of their kids being young, and now they're a little more old and are having time and space to do more things for themselves. So a lot of transitions are coming together in the group. I'm also noticing a lot of women who are ambivalent in relationships, who are wondering if they should be in a certain relationship, not in a certain relationship. And of course, women who are desiring to connect more to their own femininity, to really learn to trust, love, and accept themselves, know who they are, and really develop a strong personal identity if for whatever reason in their life, uh, they just don't feel like they have one. They don't feel super connected to themselves, their own personal truth, their power, or their soul. And also to give you an idea of the women I'm accepting, man, it's it's been so cool to see how many women have a real laundry list of things that they're just sick and tired of, that they're super fed up with, and have finally come to a place where they're, they're ready to deal with it. They're super scared. Uh, they don't necessarily know how to do it on their own, and they don't necessarily have a support system. And and so a lot of women I'm accepting are are super excited to have the support system, to have a mentor, and to have a guide as they navigate these struggles and these challenges. Um, I'm also noticing there's a lot of women who are just ready. They are ready to take these things head on finally, and they're no longer willing um, to, to silently suffer or struggle or to pretend that these things aren't happen or to let them go unresolved in their lives. So if you want want to apply, you can go to untameyourself.com forward slash mentorship. And I'll share one more thing with you. The process of filling out the application alone is worth the experience because the questions I put on that application aren't just questions that help me figure out whether or not I'd want to invite you to the mentorship. But there are probably also questions that knowing the answers to would be really valuable and useful for you to get clear on going into 2016. Some of these are questions that you're probably not asking yourself and it's super useful to even just go through the experience of filling out the application. So don't count yourself out. Don't think you need to be any kind of special type of person, certain kind of person. Um, If you have any of the issues, if you have any of the struggles or any of the desires that I already described and mentioned, go ahead and fill out that application at untameyourself.com forward slash mentorship. I'll be taking applications through December 30th only, and I will be wrapping up interviews in the first week of January. So don't miss out on an experience because you're feeling scared or nervous. If you feel any kind of tug, fill out that application, and I can't wait to speak with you. Now for today's show. Liz Dialto here, your host for the Untamed the You Wild Soul Woman podcast. And I feel like I say this every episode, but I am so excited to have today's guest with us. This is Justine Musk, who I met, I can't believe it, over four years ago when we did a mastermind together with Marie Forleo in 2011. But um, as you all know, I never give people formal introductions that you could read on their website. I want to tell you why I'm excited to have Justine here. Ever since I first met Justine, I've always been so impressed with, first of all, how intelligent she is. And I mean, the minute she opens her mouth, you guys will hear, she is one of the most well-read, but also creative people I've ever met in her life. If you have not ever visited her blog, it's her name, JustineMusk.com. She is an absolutely beautiful writer. Um, I know she has published fiction books. Justine, have you published any nonfiction yet, or is that in the works ever? Not yet. That's in the works. Cool. So, um, yeah. Thank well, you for that amazing introduction, by the way. I'm you're like, welcome. I'm so impressed with myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you should be. So um, the first question I ask every single woman on the podcast, this is the only thing that's ever planned, is hmm. what do you love about being a woman? What do I love about being a woman? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's funny because like, I can feel like an answer kind of like rising through my body. I don't know if I can articulate it, but I love the, and this sounds, I love the womanliness of being a woman. And um, I don't know how better to convey, convey that, but I feel, I've always felt really um, good, you know, in, in uh, my body and the way that I move and the whole idea of what it means to be a female. And I like, uh, I like relating to people and resonating to people, resonating with people. And, um, and I love the, I don't know. I just, um, I find men really fascinating and interesting and I would love to come back and, you know, go through life as a man, but there's something I find really rich and earthy and sensual and, um, also a, a, a real keen intelligence, a way of knowing the world and knowing other people. I think it's like, I, I, I'm really pro being a woman. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. You'll like it. Try it. You'll like it. Yeah. So, you know, you said the word sensual, and the first thing that popped up for me is I, I know, because I know you personally, that you have at least one, but maybe more than one, pet snake, right? I'm sorry, what? You have oh, pet snakes. Yeah. I actually don't. Oh, I, I thought they were yours. No, no. I, um, uh, I've had access to other people's snakes. <laughs> So I associate with you, I guess, because I know you've had photographs with snakes, and yeah. I've now seen you at two events with snakes. <laughs> so, um, but but I associate snakes largely with sensuality, and it wasn't until a bit earlier this year that I actually had an interaction with a snake. Like I had one draped around me for the first time, and They're it awesome, was they? such a crazy experience. Yeah. Yeah. So. What are your favorite ways to engage with sensuality? Dancing. Oh, bar none. I love to dance. Uh, I love music. I love feeling music go through me. Um, I've, I've always, you know, uh, um, when I was a little kid, I used to dance around my living room and I would do it in private. I would like ask everybody to leave and I would ask my babysitter to leave. And <laughs> I don't know what they thought I was doing, but my babysitter um, spied on me and she said, you know, you're actually a good dancer. And so then my friends and I started having these dance contests in my living room when I was about, you know, seven or eight or nine. And it was, we would dance to um, the records that my parents had, which were like Dr. Hook and uh, Billy Joel, Hank Williams Jr. And um, ever since then, it's, it's, it's movement. You know, it's just the way that, that um, and, and swaying and moving your hips. I mean, there's something very, very feminine about that. And I love to do that. Dancing is one of my favorites. Did you ever take a dance class or anything like that? Or it was always just whatever you felt in your body and that's how you moved? I did. I took, um, actually my first, uh, my first conscious ambition when I was a kid was uh, I wanted to be uh, an Olympic level gymnast. I wanted to be Nadia Comaneci. Mm -hmm. And um, that did not work out, I'm sad to say. But, um, but part of that was the, the floor exercise, the floor routine. I love to watch that. So I took, um, I took ballet and jazz, but I didn't really have, I don't have the body for it. I'm a little heavy on my feet. Um, and then I got involved in uh, martial arts when I was, when I was older and I really loved that. So I think for me, it's, it's, um, it's the music. Yes. But it's also the, the, the choreographed movement. There's something about, um, uh, learning certain movements and, and, uh, training them into your body and performing them and kind of creating this language of movement and expressing yourself that way. I think there's not enough emphasis on that in this culture, but I really do think that there's something about moving that helps you think and kind of like brings this, this new level to your awareness of yourself in the world and, and, um, and that makes your whole life richer. Uh, I'm totally on board with that and anyone listening who's listened to any episodes before or anyone who's taken Wild Slow Movement knows that I agree with that a thousand percent. There's there's so much, uh, before we got on and started the interview, you and I were talking a little bit about emotional resonance. And I think there's really a way that the body can express things, kind of like what you said when I asked uh, what you love about being a woman. You're like, ooh, I feel it in my body, but I don't necessarily know how to articulate it. So it's almost like a whole different language or dialect in the body. Yeah. And I just want to clarify, like, I'm not one of those people who says, uh, you know, oh, woman, she is the body. She is the earth. Like, I'm not talking about that in any kind of reductionist sense. Um, I think that um, I think that in this culture we put so much emphasis on um, thinking 
you know, like the only way to know the world is through through thinking about it. And that's not true. I mean, we also know the world through um, through our senses and through our imagination and just through being like present in the moment. And it's those other things, particularly being present in the moment and feeling your connection to, um, you know, to trees or to grass or to nature or to music. Or, I mean, these are the things that reassure us that we're not alone and they get us out of our head and they keep us sane. I dig that. So I know there are a lot of self-help slash personal development, you know, books, blogs, plenty of people talk about being present or living in the now or living in the moment. I'm sure I've done that too. Yeah. And there, well, this is why I love asking you things. Cause I feel like the answer you give is like, this is why I love reading your blog. I feel like you just don't talk about things the way everybody else does. So, <laughs> uh, is, is being present, is that just your way of being or was that a, a skill or practice you developed over time? Oh, for me, it's definitely a skill. It's definitely a practice. And I work on that every day. Um, it, it, it even took me a long time just to figure out why it's important to wrap my mind around what it actually is. I mean, I'm someone who's been living in my head since I was a kid. And I disconnected from, um, I disconnected from a lot of emotions, actually. And, and uh, um, I, I kind of numbed out in a lot of ways. So coming... Um, Coming back in touch, you know, in touch with my feelings, I should say, has, has been, it's a process. I mean, it's, it's something that this culture doesn't really teach us how to do, how to feel your feelings come up and how to acknowledge them and learn what you need to learn from them because they are a form of information and then just let them go. Instead, we like, we sit on them, we repress them until they, you know, until something boils over and we explode. And women have this reputation for being, you know, um, hysterical and crazy and all of that, but like it happens to men. And sometimes when it happens to a man, he takes a gun and he goes somewhere public and he shoots a lot of people. So it's not something that is particularly exclusive to either gender. It's, it's something that, um, it's like a toxin in this culture that, that, um, unhooks us from some vital sense of what it means to be alive. And I think we really do suffer for it. I agree with you. So what is your process or current process to when you know you want to be present, mm -hmm. what, what are, you know, what are the steps or the actions that you take to, to get into that place where you know that you are, you're grounded, you're in it and you're here. Yoga was my, um, entry into all of that. So I, I um, I started doing a younger yoga with a, a private instructor and she was the one who made me realize that I tend to, um, I tend to lean into the future. So, uh, I love like when I was a kid, I got into this habit of uh, daydreaming about the future because the future was so much more interesting to me and it was such a happier place than the childhood I was actually living. So I have this tendency to, to rush forward and I tend to, I mean, I talk quickly. Um, when I was playing music, I would play music too quickly. Like I'm always just, I want the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And so what yoga did was it forces me to stop and appreciate the moment because so much of um, a pose is about alignment and these subtle shifts and these um, tiny things that you do and these tiny differences that you feel in your body that actually make a big difference. And then when you put, um, like a, when you put each little moment on top of each other little moment, then the pose just takes care of itself and you don't even have to worry about it. It's like, oh, I'm standing on my head. I mean, that's, that was like an incredible revelation to me. So, so yoga helped and then that kind of got me into meditation and so that's what I'm doing right now. And now I'm trying to bring a little more nature work into that, like going outside and just kind of, um, you know, shutting my mind off and, uh, you know, getting in touch with my breathing, um, all of that. And then just feeling, um, feeling what's going on around me and, and trying to relate to it through um, much more of an intuitive sense than just thinking, oh, the trees are pretty. Right. Yeah, so what kind, I love asking, a lot of people mention meditation, and it just always astounds me how many types of meditation there are. What's yeah. your current meditation practice look like? Oh, it's, um, it's not uh, very esoteric. It's just me lying down on my bed, <laughs> closing my eyes. And then just, just uh, um, I was doing it sitting up for a while, and then uh, that's good too. But um, I like lying down. For a while, I was listening to... Um, I, you know, those, um, those, those beats that they give you in order to kind of calm your brain waves. Yeah. The binaural I beats, be... I think. Sorry. Binaural beats. Is that what it's called? Yes. Yes. And I find that really effective and uh, nature sounds, you know, the sounds of the ocean, the sounds of water. 
um, I have a koi pond and I go out and I look at my koi pond and that really does something to my mind. It just kind of, of um, settles it. And it's that feeling of having a settled mind that is so blissful. I mean, I, mean, I wish I'd known of it like 20 years ago. Yeah. So, so it's, it's kind of, and then I have a friend who's threatening to get me into Kundalini. I haven't done that yet, but I think I'm, I think I'm at that point where I'm like ready to chant. And that's a big thing for me. Oh, this is a cool conversation because I had never gone to any kind of kirtan or done any chanting until mm -hmm. a, a little over a year ago. I, I did one module of a yoga teacher training with Sianna Sherman in, in Venice Beach in LA. And I, it's, there's something with my voice. I just never, growing up in my house, anyone who sang got made fun of because it was usually like my grandma or my mom and everyone's tone deaf and it's horrible. <laughs> so I think I just thought none of us could sing better not try it or you're going to get made fun of. Yeah. So, um, it's kind of another way we learn to, you know, be quiet, isn't it? You it's learn exactly to right. Yeah. And, but when you go, there's that train I was telling you would <laughs> inevitably come through during the interview. When you go to a kirtan and then people are just chanting and it doesn't matter. Everything yeah. just comes together and it sounds so beautiful. And to have the experience of singing with abandon or without abandon, yeah. I don't know, but not giving a shit what it sounds like yeah. and feeling that reverberation and the resonance in your body of your own yeah. voice singing, that yeah. opened up a new depth of sensuality for me that just, it feels so, especially with other people, there's yeah. just something about the group dynamic and chanting. Um, yeah. I think I resisted it too because, and I don't know if you could relate to this at all, anyone with any kind of religious backgrounds any type of singing or recitation I'd ever done in my life was in uh -huh. Catholic church. Yeah. And yeah. I, I kind of associated it with like mild brainwashing, not really <laughs> healing or empowerment. So uh, that was my resistance. You know, it's funny because I resisted it too. And um, I just made that connection because like I went to Sunday school and church. For me, it was Presbyterian. And uh, uh, you know what? I think there really is something there. I think, I think there's something about, you know, being forced to stand and sing these hymns. And, and, um, you know, coming to associate them with, uh, um, with, uh, with a way of thinking, um, with a, a form of, of dogma that, that feels to me, um, it, it doesn't open me up spiritually. It makes me feel, um, it makes me feel, uh, heavy and, and ashamed. So, uh, that, that's an interesting connection you made. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I actually went back for the first time in years to a Catholic church a couple months ago just to have the experience. And for the first time ever, I was I was engaged with the words. Yeah. Like what they were actually saying and what it actually means. Yeah. And and to have that experience being this version of myself with my new goggles and ears yeah. and my perception of the world versus really just realizing how mindlessly I just repeated what was That's put in it, front yeah. of me for Mindless so yeah. many years. Yeah, like not knowing what, like the, the words themselves don't have any meaning and it's it's just something you do because somebody commands you to do it. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no emotional resonance with what's going on. No emotional resonance, however, yeah. I, also without any previous understanding of the power of words and conscious language, I still said that shit so many times and, and put those words and those beliefs like into my body and into my system. It was quite terrifying on one hand, but then also gave me a ton of compassion for all yeah. the work that I've done over the last couple years oh, yeah. to recondition and reprogram myself. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting that you use those words like conditioning and programming because this is the thing about chanting and, and, uh, and this is why we do associate it with cults because cults use it because it alters your consciousness. And when you're in that form of altered consciousness, you are so much more susceptible for whatever information that they are, you know, instilling in you because they're literally instilling it in you. So to, to open yourself up to that, to open yourself up like that, to make yourself vulnerable to someone who does not have your best interests in mind is really scary. It's super scary. And, and it's very much, you've mentioned the culture several times, which is yeah. perfect because we talk about that on the podcast all the time. This is very much our, our culture because as, as progressive as the culture is now more so than it ever has been, it's still very Judeo-Christian in its roots. Oh, yeah. And so there is still so much that has grown from and come from religious backgrounds and foundations and practices. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at, um, you, you have to look at how this culture was structured. And those structures are still in place. 
So, I mean, I think we tend to think that like power is always within the individual, so you can be whatever you want to be. And, and we don't give enough credit to the fact that as individuals, we still move through this web of relationships and we move through these, these, um, these ideas that, that structure the way we think about, um, you know, culture and, and, uh, and, and school and education and all of these things. I mean, you know, these were, these are not like laws of nature. These were, um, like man-made, literally man-made, um, constructs. And they're still very much in place. And those values that are embedded in the language we use and the words we use and in those structures that we move through, I mean, those are still alive. And I think that's why we feel such a push-pull uh, today because, you know, um, we are progressive or, you know, a lot of us are progressive, but we still have that, that, um, that pull, that anxiety because something, you know, there's something in conflict around us. And I think we can sense it, but we have trouble giving words to it sometimes. Yeah. Oh, man. This is so great. So I know you and I have talked offline before. I remember having a conversation with you about this about a year ago at the Open Books event about applying the the hero's journey concept, but in a feminine way, right? Yeah. So I just love to hear you talk about this. Can you riff on that a little bit or whatever is feeling relevant or passionate for you in the moment on the topic? Now, this is actually something I think a lot about, partly because, um, I mean, I love mythology. I love depth psychology. I'm really into all of that. And I'm a writer and a storyteller. So the hero's journey, you know, um, plus I was a huge Star Wars fan. So all of these things kind of, of, you know, coalesce into this big fascination with the hero's journey. And so as a woman, I want to figure out, I want to see myself in that journey. And it's just, it's interesting because it, it, as a person, I relate to the hero's journey. As a woman, I've had a lot more trouble because the hero's journey is always put forward in these very masculine terms. And then these um, alternative versions, you know, are, like appear, you know, here and, and there, and they have um, a, a different sense of what makes up the feminine journey. But that doesn't necessarily resonate with me either. They both feel incomplete. And I think it's because um, the hero's journey, it does have this, this uh, um, I guess what you would call this, this female um, dimension to it, but because it is feminine, we really don't talk about it and we don't give it enough, um, you know, and it's not as well known. And it's this whole idea about descending into the unconscious and, um, it's, it's about, uh, becoming whole. It's about reuniting. It's about death and rebirth actually. And, and so what happens is that something happens. Um, it's usually, it's a crisis of some kind, it's a betrayal and, um, you're like dragged down into the underworld like uh, Persephone and, and Hades. And so you have, to, um, you have to, to go down into your own darkness and you have to confront the truths that are down there. And it's a very difficult journey and it hurts, it's, it's painful, but it's also a way to take whatever pain and suffering you're going through and make something useful out of it. Because the end result is that you um, uh, reintegrate these lost aspects of yourself and you, you know, rise up into your daily life and you're much stronger and more powerful and more knowing for it. And I think that, um, and it's, it's a process of initiation. It's kind of like a, the, the female initiation. Yeah. And so that aspect of the hero's journey has been kind of like taken out of it and, and um, you know, called the descent. And then there've been all of these riffs on that. But I think it's part of the hero's journey. And it's something that, I mean, men do it too. Men will descend. And at some point women have to go out into the world and they have to slay dragons. So that's kind of the major difference, the, fem the, the female hero's journey, so to speak is all about um, psychological growth. And then the, um, the male hero's journey is all about going out into the world and you know, finding treasure or um, you know, uh, uh, conquering the tyrant and taking the throne or finding your place. But you know, the, these two journeys, they have to go together. So men have to make that depth into the psychological darkness and they have to you know, come to terms with whatever it is they're running away from. And women, you know, we have to go out into the world too and we have to um, you know, have our quest and have our adventures. And so nobody's really kind of um, connected those two yet in a way that satisfies me. And I, I think that's, that's, um, that's a real source of frustration for me. And then people will say, the, oh, the hero's journey, you know, as it's laid out now, you know, it applies to women as equally as it does men. But when you look at the, the characters in the hero's journey, it's all about, you know, it's, it's like um, at one point the hero is tempted by the goddess, you know, and then right. there's atonement with the father. I mean, these are, these, these are different experiences for women. And I also, we even go so far as to say that, that there's also kind of a, um, and I don't quite know how to say this and it's a really tricky subject, but there's like a, uh, almost like a level of erotic trauma. I think that has to do with being in a feminine body 
when the feminine body is so maligned in so many ways and, and has been for so long, that there's a, a, a source of, of shame that um, we as women kind of need to, um, to heal. And maybe men have their own version of it. I, I can't speak to that because I'm not one. But it's just, you know, there hasn't really been... Um, there hasn't really been enough talk about that. And I don't know why that is, but it's something that I think I want to go forward and, and do myself. I Just love, see, yeah. I can't wait until you do, um, because I love watching through your writing, the way your mind works. So you said so many things there that I would love to unpack a little bit. Oh, awesome. <laughs> First, are you familiar with any of Esther Perel's work? Yes, she's uh, Mating in Captivity. Yeah, so I've never read her book, but I heard I was listening to her be interviewed on another podcast, and hopefully by the time this airs, she has said yes, and I will have gotten to interview her because I would <laughs> love to chat with her. So, yeah. But she said something that really struck me because doing so much work around reclaiming and redefining womanhood in the 21st century, one of the things I notice is how so many women are are suffering or struggling right now in different areas of their life because. For the most part, we've been raised to just be lovelier versions of men in order to succeed and survive in this society. And yeah. so that's like the choice that we're given. You know, right? yeah. be like a female, which is about, <laughs> you know, being the wife and mother, or you can be successful in the world, which necessitates you be like an honorary man. I mean, that's right. But that doesn't work for us because we're not men and people don't respond to us as if we were men. So when we do some of the things that men do, we get penalized for it in a way that yeah. men don't. I mean, so it's it's kind of frustrating. There's a large damned if you do, damned if you don't <laughs> yes, energy exactly. to it. So what I heard Esther Perel say, which, you know, my partner Mike coaches men. So I've uh -huh. learned so much about men's issues from yeah. being with Mike. And I have so much more compassion for the male experience. And, and one of the things Esther said was how, you know, since the beginning of time, and this is very much the traditional hero's journey, men have to prove their manhood. Yeah. But women yeah. don't. Traditionally. Yeah. Women, I mean, it's just assumed that you're going to be fertile, that you can have children, and that yes. someone will want you at some point, right? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, masculinity is something that men, you know, have to gain. Mm -hmm. Femininity is something that women stand to lose, you know, like if you yeah. don't, yeah, if you don't have children, or if you're not, you know, if you don't have the right kind of appearance, or if you can't like, you know, if you can't put on that whole feminine persona, then you're not a woman. Yeah. Yeah. And now we live in a culture that women have made so many strides. Something I've said before on the podcast is it, it must be, and whether it's consciously or unconsciously, kind of terrifying for men to exist in this current iteration of the culture. Because at this point in time, there's not a single thing anymore that a man can do that a, uh, a woman, yeah, that a man can do that a woman can't. But there will always be that one thing have a baby that a woman can do that a man can't. True. Well, I mean, you know, with science. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows what, what will happen so, upon. Yeah. But that, that, that going into the soul yeah. and that descending, I think is what you called it. Yeah. What, what's interesting too, though, is there's almost this standard around – that it's not safe or not okay for women to actually be dark or express those dark emotions or experience anger for fear of, yeah. you know, God knows what kind of labeling or persecution. Well, think about it. the only group in this culture that's really allowed to be angry, to express angry outbursts in public is, is white men. Because when anybody else does it, I mean, it's, it's, it's dangerous because it's a genuine threat to the status quo because anger is a catalyst to action. So get enough people angry you know, and, and they will rise up and then you have revolution and then you're kind of screwed as a ruling power, or at least your life is made really, really inconvenient. So it's, it's, uh, and again, I'm not blaming, um, you know, like, like contemporary men for this. I'm not yeah. coming out and saying, Oh, you know, men are evil. I think men are awesome. It's just, it, like you said, it's the culture and, um, patriarchy is, um, th this is something that I think doesn't get stressed enough. So I'm just going to make a quick little Digression here. Patriarchy actually means law of the fathers. It's not the law of men. It's law of the father. So what it means is that power belongs in the hands of the father. So it belongs in the hands of a few men. It doesn't belong in the hands of all men. But um, but in patriarchy in general, it does mean that um, you know that the 
the, the lowest status man is still higher than the lowest status woman. So by virtue of being male, you're still superior to being a woman, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're powerful in the world per se. So I, I think that, um, you know, men get frustrated because I think a lot of, um, well, I know from my blog that a lot of what I say, sometimes it resonates with uh, a lot of men as well as women. And then um, I've had um, comments on my Facebook page and, and comments on my blog that kind of indicate that that men are kind of looking for a way, some men are looking for a way to be part of this conversation, but they're not quite sure, um, you know, where it, it pertains to them. And it's not really something, I mean, the worst thing you can express as a man is any sense of, you know, vulnerability. I mean, like a, a man, you're a man when you're strong, and if you're vulnerable, then you're a woman, and that's the worst thing that you can be. So where do they go to, to kind of talk about these things, which is why I think that what your partner is doing is so great. Yeah. So, um, you know what? And I just completely forgot where I was going with that. So it's I'll fine. Have a I do that you. all the time. I, yeah. I have a thought. I think it's about to be complete, and then I don't know where. So we'll just. You're like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. There seemed like there was a destination. It's but, fine. We'll just, we'll just redirect. Yeah. My only hope ever with these interviews is that at least pieces of them are useful for people. So yeah, exactly. you've already said many useful things. If that one thing was a little bleep. Totally fine. So, which which I, I didn't I didn't even notice if you would have said anything. Shoot, I should not have called your attention to it. It's yeah. fine, but maybe that's just because that's I how my brain works. Dramatic to... statement. <laughs> and um, ah, oh, this is so. This is great. This is I enjoy. You know, what else about the culture? Uh, we were having a bit of a conversation. Just what would you love to see? You were talking about how when you were little, you always used to think about the future being so much brighter and more fun. If yeah. you could just paint an ideal picture and get your way, what would you love to see? What would be different? Oh, my God. I would love to see teenage girls be taken seriously with respect. I would love to see a culture where the inner life of a teenage girl is not dismissed as drama or seen as something that she needs to, you know, be on top of. Um, I, I wish that um, teenage girls got this feeling that, that, that what they want is okay and um, what they feel within their body is okay and they can trust that internal sense of, of um, what is healthy for them. And I, I don't know, again, it's, it's kind of hard to put this in words, but I, I think that that's why the... Whenever I think about the heroine's journey and descent, for some reason, it always links to me to this image of all these teenage girls who like secretly cut themselves or, um, and then, you know, and then there are eating disorders and all of that. But it's all this, this, I think, you know, anger and rage or pain and it's always turned inward and it's always expressed on the body. You know, it's, it's like they're not heard in the culture in a way that um, makes them feel seen and understood. So they kind of turn around and they take it out on their body because for women for so long, um, being seen was our way of being heard. You know, there are all these studies that show, um, like when a woman says things, um, it's not heard, but if a man says the same thing, then, oh, suddenly it's a great idea. And uh, people will attribute more authority and credibility to a male opinion, uh, even if the woman in the room is, is just as educated or even more educated and, and more insightful. And then, um, and then uh, as a woman too, I notice, um, you know, how often I get interrupted and, and um, to the point where like I've had to train myself to interrupt the people interrupting me. <laughs> and it's, it's, and it's not like, uh, uh, and part of the reason why I have to do that is because I was raised with the message that you never interrupt, you know, that you're a woman. So you're the listener and you, you do the listening and the men do the talking. And anyway, this is kind of a long rambling way of saying, I think there's a sense that, um, I think the whole, why there's so much emphasis on, you know, a woman's voice and finding her voice. I mean, it's, it's not so much that we don't know where our voice is. Like, it's like, we don't have to, like, it's not like we left it somewhere around the house or in the car or we left it in a <laughs> restaurant or like it forgot it at Starbucks. I mean, it's here, it's my voice. But, you know, just because you have a voice doesn't mean you're being listened to. Yeah. And um, when you're not listening to somebody, when somebody feels unheard, I mean, that's when things break down and, um, and that's when you that's when violence happens. And if it's not violence, you know, inflicted on, on, um, possessions or houses or, or properties or other people, God forbid, um, then it, it turns inward and it's violence against the self. And, uh, and you know, that's what, that's what you see with teenage girls and it, it breaks my heart. And I just think the whole, why the dissent fascinates me is because the dissent is saying, um, it's okay to feel these dark emotions. They actually lead you somewhere. Um, they somewhere, they lead you somewhere good 
good in terms of, of they give you, there's a way to make meaning of them. There's a way to enrich your life. And there's a way to come out of this process with wisdom, you know, the kind of wisdom that's associated with uh, initiation rites, which were all about um, using pain and in some cases like deliberately inflicting pain to, you know, alter your consciousness enough to, to come out transformed. And a female, I just, I can't help thinking that if young women had that, um, that sense of how to move through that process, then, um, you know, maybe they, maybe they wouldn't have to cut themselves, you know, like maybe, maybe there'd be, um, a light at the end of the tunnel and they wouldn't feel quite so bleak and despairing. Yeah, man. I was reading something on Facebook the other day about a recent rape that made it into the media of a high school girl in a very privileged community. And the conversation was actually started by a former client of mine. And I really appreciated what she said because so much of, of rape prevention education is for the teenage girls about yeah. how to make yourself less susceptible to being a victim versus yeah. educating teenage boys and, and adolescent it. boys not to fucking treat women like that. Exactly. <laughs> How about we teach men not to rape? <laughs> yes. Fuck. Yeah, acknowledge that most of gender violence is actually male on female violence. I mean, you know, we don't, and I think it's because, I think it's because as women, we do love men. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, and, and we're not saying, oh, you know, you, Joe, you, you're a rapist. No, we're not right. saying that, but we're saying that, okay, your gender is kind of responsible for, for, um, this particular way of treating our gender and it's just the way it is. And let's work with that. Let's yeah. change, let's change the dynamic between the two genders. And, uh, but it, I think to do that, we kind of have to raise, or we have to elevate the conversation to a place where it's not quite yet. I mean, we have to recognize a place where we're both vulnerable and we can kind of meet at this point of shared vulnerability and really listen to each other. And we're not there yet. Yeah. And so I also think with the Judeo-Christian roots, again, part yeah. of the issue is that sex is still such a taboo subject yes. and hailed as so inappropriate. Yeah. I remember, this was years ago, catching an episode of Oprah where they were talking about educating middle school children about masturbation so uh -oh. that it would be acceptable, especially women. Cause like I remember being in middle school and it was just like common. That's when boys discover, I mean, their, what their penises can do. And I know yes. you have sons, so I'm sure you're probably experiencing this in some capacity and witnessing it happening, but, um, we'll not go there. Yeah. 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 We don't have to <laughs> break into the details, but to embarrass well, anyone just, in the just, future. Just, yeah, I, I do have to say it's very interesting to tell male friends that you have, you know, five boys or when the subject of having five boys comes up because, of course, there's always one topic that, that men seem to inevitably raise about what's going to happen in the teenage years. But it's just, you know, and a meaningful silence descended. Let's <laughs> <laughs> but, um, man, so the, the whole thing was, uh, was around actually educating women that it's not shameful to experience pleasure or to yes, explore exactly. in that place. Because, and I think one of the things that I find to be so sad about these stories is, I mean, it's awesome that this one came to the media because someone spoke up, but how many people think they can't say anything? And, and, and what you were talking about, that pain being turned inward when something like that happens and then nobody yeah. knows, how do you process that? Yeah. Because, it, you know, as human beings, we are wired to communicate and to express ourselves. Right. And, uh, and our, our, our physical health is dependent upon our relationships with the people around us. And um, a relationship is, is predicated on being seen and understood and acknowledged by, you know, this person. That's what intimacy is. And so take that away. And then, you know, then, then you've got all kinds of, you know, you've got the conditions for all kinds of damage. So it's, it's uh, and like you said, female pleasure. I mean, we don't, we still don't know in this culture what, what, female sexual agency or female sexual pleasure um, looks like because, and, and again, teenage girls pick this up because it, it's, you know, they, sex become, because sex cannot be something that you can do just to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be something, it has to be a means to an end. So sex becomes a way or sexual activity becomes a way to get, to get popularity or to get a boy to like you or um, it, it not having sex becomes a way to, you know, get, get respect or, um, you know, get, it's, it's what you use. You, we're, we're taught, we're given all this dating advice that teaches us to, um, you know, uh, uh, deny the man sex for like a certain period of time yeah. so that we can get to the relationship. You know what I mean? So there, there's, yeah. there's nothing. So like it, it's, it's, how do you 
teach young women that, that sex is something that you should engage in um, only when you are completely comfortable and confident that this is right for you. And whether you want to do it or whether you don't want to do it, like, that's what it should be. And, and um, um, here are your boundaries, by the way. Oh, yes, here the way. Like, here are your boundaries and this is your body. <laughs> Yeah. And nobody else, nobody else has any right to it other than you. And nobody else has any right to tell you what to do with it. And um, it, it's that message in this culture is still so uh, conflicted. It's so conflicted. And, and even that, like, nobody gets to tell you what to do with your body. Yeah. And even that, I mean, you know, a lot of people would argue with me right there. So Right. And, and I wouldn't. I'm not one of those people. I was irate. This was months ago. I was actually, I was being interviewed on a podcast and, and my friend brought this up, my friend Jess, because she knew it would friggin' piss me off. Her <laughs> daughter, I don't remember if she was like a junior or senior in high school, somewhere in Delaware. This actually ended she up wearing being, yoga pants? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Oh, you're like, kidding. I am not even kidding. What oh, happened oh is God, the that school, was right no. The school it's like, it's like actually the, the great evil of the world. Great it's evil like, of the world. It was in the school's um, dress code policy that girls could not wear yoga pants, yeah. and and the message was very clear because it distracts the boys. Because it distracts the boys. Yeah. Oh my god! That, I was like, yeah. "Are you kidding me?" But then this is even worse. So her principal, male principal, one day she wasn't wearing. She didn't wear a bra to school, and apparently she had. She, was, she didn't have a large chest, so like I don't even know how it was noticeable. But the principal went up to her and asked if she was wearing a bra You're and kidding. told her she had to wear one. Are you kidding me? No. Please explain to me how that's uh, – I, I lost it. I went nuts on her podcast. I'm like, I hope I could curse on this podcast because it's happening. Yeah. Um, even, just, even just that message, right? Like you can't wear this because it's going to distract them goes yeah. back to what we were saying a few minutes ago about putting the responsibility on the woman to not, hey, hey please yeah. do me a favor. You're going to be treated as an object either way, but here's how to less appear as one. Exactly. What yeah, is to, that? to not appear that you're asking for it. You know, like, like it's one thing if you were teaching people, um, teaching kids that there's something called, you know, like a professional dress. And, you know, it'd be one thing if, if that was applied equally to both genders. And, right. and so that, that um, you know, that this whole idea of, of what it means to um, dress casually or to dress more formally or, or that kind of thing. But, but to just frame that whole discussion in terms of girls, you know, being too sexy for boys or, or being responsible for, like, the boys' physical reactions to them. I mean, that's just another way of, of um, it's, it's another way of scapegoating women for, um, for uh, uh, the taboo sexuality in this culture. I mean, you know, men are not supposed to have these reactions and... They don't want to, like, a lot of them don't want to have these reactions because it doesn't, like, you know, align with the Judeo-Christian beliefs. And so just, you know, make it the woman's fault. It's Eve's fault. You know, it's, it's, it's yoga pants. So the problem with this world is not, it's not income inequality. It's not, like, climate crisis. It's, it's you know, yoga pants. But if we can so just ridiculous. yoga pants. Oh, and tank tops. Tank tops, too. Oh, yeah. You know, get rid of all of them, then we've got a harmonious, harmonious world. Yeah, that would, that would solve the problems. Somehow boys wouldn't find a way to be curious about what's going on under those sleeves and those yeah. baggy pants. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a bummer. And you know, for anyone listening, I just want to be super clear in case you didn't hear it when Justine said it, and I stand with her. This isn't about men are wrong, women are right, yeah. women are victims, men are the inflictors. It's really not. It's, no. it's the culture we're operating in right now, personally, I believe, is not very just for either side. Cause yeah. he's and again, from from being with Mike and seeing like Men have so much shame that they don't express, and you said this earlier. The most, the worst thing a man can do is be vulnerable. There's yeah. this story I always, I always refer back to that that part in Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, where she talks about the man in the yellow sweater yeah. who goes up to her after the lecture and says, yeah. "Where's the research for men?" Like, yeah. points to his daughters and wife and says, "They'd rather see me die on my white horse than hear what's really going on with me." Yeah, and um. Because that's the thing. We, you know, we absorb it too. And, and we become part of perpetuating that whole idea that, you know, if a man cries in front of us, he's not a man. And, you know, right. it, 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 and so we, we, we play into the system in our, our own ways. And so it, it's, but I, I like the way that um, instead of referring to things as like, because we in this culture, we say, well, this is feminine and this is masculine. Yeah. And, and, and I think that creates all kinds of problems. I like the whole idea of, okay, this is yin and this is yang. Yeah. And they're like these two opposing sets of values, but they complement They complement each other. Yeah. And some people are more yang and some people are more yin, but it's a spectrum too. Like you can be, you know, you can have so much yang and so much yin and this is just your unique mix of it. Like, you know, that, that seems to me just to be a little more um, 
you know, when, when you talk like that, then you're not associating any set of particular values with a particular biological sex. And that just gives you so much more freedom to be who you are without getting penalized for it or punished for it or yeah. stoned for it or mocked for it or, you know, and put in jail. It, yeah. And it is just the truth that, like, everyone has both. So yeah. um, for anyone listening, Justine was talking earlier about those those darker emotions. Um, if, if anyone wants to know more about that, there was an episode way, way, way back in the beginning, probably like the first five or six podcasts with uh, Foxy Pickett and then another one with Jen Blackstock where we talked about – shadow side and darker emotions and things like that. So check that out if that interests you. And then on this topic that Justine just brought up of masculine and feminine, I did a three-part series called How to Be More Feminine. And even, even that alone, calling it How to Be More Feminine, the whole point was that, you know, in our culture, again, women, they were supposed to be feminine, but you got to kind of exhibit these masculine traits to be successful. So it's like, what does that even mean and why? Yeah. And then it's, it's, um, it's the femininity in this culture, it's, it's stigmatized. It's stigmatized yeah. for both men and for women too, because to be feminine still means, you know, to be weak, to be trivial, to cry at nothing, to, you know, wear pink pes- pastel yeah. Yeah. sweaters, like, you know, it, it's, it's bows in your hair. Like it, it's a, uh, it's, it's something that women also learn to distance themselves from. Right. And so it's just, you know, and, and both genders lose. Yeah. And, um, there was another interview with Michaela Bohm. When oh, she talked about, um, I agree with you that everybody loses when that's the set. Michaela Bohm, are you familiar with her at all? I don't think so. She's like the co-teacher for David Data. Oh, okay. When he t- teaches his workshops. Um, she's, pretty, she's pretty amazing. She's Austrian. What I love about her is she just doesn't give a fuck. She's not from this <laughs> culture. So she'll just say whatever and she doesn't mind at all being labeled as whatever anyone wants to call her. So yeah. she just goes for it, and I really, it's actually super refreshing. But um, she talks about in her interview the difference between masculine and feminine essence, right? Because everyone has an, a, an essence, one thing, one way or another that you're a bit more inclined to. But yeah. everyone has masculine and feminine energy. Every man and every woman. And I actually had this astrology reading last week where uh, the guy was saying something about how, you know, for everyone on the planet, a lot of the work that we're here to do is for the women to integrate and accept their masculine energy and for the men to integrate and accept their feminine energy. Yeah. And it's easier for us to, you know, integrate our masculine energy because, you know, a girl can be a tomboy and that's great. Yeah. But, but there was that, um, there was that picture, I think it was in New York times or something. It was a, uh, a woman, she was like painting her son's toenails and uh, she got massacred for it. Mm. As like she was, you know, child abuse. So, you know, when a boy puts on a dress, it's let's send him to the psychologist or something wrong. So there's still that. that uh, and I'm sure just even like saying that image, I'm sure just, just you know, struck like this visceral horror in, in uh, um, the hearts of some people listening. And uh, even if they don't want to feel that way. So there's something, there's something very, um, there's something there that we really kind of need to take a look at. Yeah, man, it's so interesting. And you know what? You mentioned this, just in case anyone listening doesn't know what it means. Can you briefly explain what you meant when you said yin and yang? Oh, um, well, it's a uh, uh, it's a way of, of um, sorry. Let me just think of how I can. Yeah, take your time. Well, when we talk about masculine and we talk about feminine, um, I think it's important to say that that masculine and feminine we're really talking about two opposing uh, sets of values, and so and they're they're. Um, you know, they're complementary to each other. So the, the masculine is, um, it's, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's happening in a male body. It just means it's a particular kind of energy. It's active, um, it's aggressive, it's uh, associated with, you know, rational thought, with civilization, with daylight, with, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that energy that goes out into the world and uh, it makes stuff happen. And then the feminine, you know, is, is all about uh, receptivity and um, um, it, it being like uh, softer, like it's a different kind of, and it's more relationship oriented and, yeah. and not as task oriented. And so it's a, it's a different kind of power, but it's not a form of power that we um, really give much credence to in this culture because, um, because it's feminine. And so because it's feminine, then there's this stigma around it. And um, so it's, it's um, and then when I was talking earlier about the hero's journey, like the, the, the feminine, the descent, that's all about, um, that's all about, you know, that's all about opening up to what the world is happening and, and letting yourself be vulnerable and letting yourself sink deep into yourself and, uh, uh, and letting yourself change. So, um, 
um, I, I think part of the problem is that we do uh, attach these um, these words to these sets of values, and and so sometimes we're confused. We don't really know if we're talking, or we we our feelings kind of get tangled up in the sense of when you're talking about the feminine, you're also talking about women. But you could be talking about the feminine, and you could be talking about like a man in your life who yeah. is you know, very feminine, and and the same with with women. And and so I like um so the the um I like yin and yang because these are the eastern concepts are the same concepts but they're given a different yeah. name and if you look at the, the the famous yin yang symbol uh what i like about it too is that it's a symbol of of wholeness and integration because each side has a, a dot of the other energy inside it so the yin side um which i think is the black side has the uh the the white circle in it and then um the the other half has the black circle in it and it's a way of saying that um, you, you can be more one side or the other, but you still need to have some of that other energy in you because that's what um, makes us whole. That's what makes us healthy and uh, really able to function, you know, not just in the world, but able to function in our relationships. And if you can't function in your relationships, then at some point you're going to have trouble functioning within yourself because we're all, you know, we're all wired together. It's kind of like a, um, one of the... the concepts that I came across last year that I really liked the most was that they're discovering now that it's not just mind-body, it's, it's mind-body relationship. You can't really disentangle these three things because they have such a powerful impact on each other. Yeah, it's so, so interesting. So one more thing I want to, have you ever read the book or heard of the book, Men Explain Things to Me? <laughs> By Rebecca, I can't pronounce her last name, I won't. Um, you know what, I, um, I have it. I've started reading it, and so I, I know that um, that the concept of mansplaining is uh, yeah. is, is credited to her. I, yeah, although I, I think she um, dissoci- uh, uh, I, I think she doesn't want to take responsibility for that term actually, but I know that it it, it, it came out of that book. Yeah, it's so funny because when you were saying that earlier, um, I thought of that, and I'm in the same boat. I downloaded it to my Kindle because a friend had recommended it, and I started reading it. Then I put it down, and I just haven't gone back to it yet. But, you know, through, through doing, having these conversations on the podcast, I am constantly seeing how, you know, we all do this. We grow up and, we, and then we look back at our childhood and we go, yeah, well, that sucked and this, that, and the other thing. But I, I feel like at this point, I have almost opposite experiences all the time because I was not. I just didn't grow up in an environment where the women were quieted or, and I don't know, I don't know if that's a result of actually ethnic background, like primarily Italian and Puerto Rican. It just like, everyone was just friggin' like loud. And my mom always says, we're not passive aggressive, we're outward aggressive. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and also maybe it's just cause my mom had three sisters and they were all just so smart, all of them pretty successful. So I didn't grow up in that environment where like women were told to like hush or shut up. Like that's hilarious, that concept to me. <laughs> I'm like, come, come hang out at my house, and uh, that's just not the way things were. But it's so it's it's interesting and, and illuminating and really helpful for me actually to be like, holy shit, like that's a real thing for a lot, a lot of people. Oh yeah, yeah. So what are some you mentioned uh, learning how to interrupt, and I know on your website too you have, uh, and if this applies to anyone, you know, I talk about boundaries all the time too in Wild Soul Movement, but. Um, you have something on your website, it's like 25 badass ways to say no. <laughs> and then you were just, you mentioned something about getting really good at interrupting the people who are interrupting you. What are some of, how do you do that? You know, it's um, like, I'm Canadian. So being polite is a big thing with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I train my kids to say, and I'm very, very proud of this. They say, please and thank you and all of that. So I'm not, by any means, I am not saying be rude. Um, but I am saying, yeah, like you said, it's, it's, it's boundaries. It's kind of holding your own in a dialogue where, um, your, your, um, your opinion is going to be penalized just, you know, maybe just a little bit or maybe, um, a lot and probably a little more than you even realize because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a woman's opinion. And I think, I think, um, men just, I mean, men interrupt each other too. And I think it's because there's kind of this, this competitive aspect to the way that they communicate because they're always kind of, um, you know, they communicate to establish status as much as anything else where women, you know, we really want to communicate with each, with each other and we want to make sure that, well, some of us want to make sure that everybody gets their say. But, um, so it, yeah, it, it, I just, I learned to, um, and women, some women will interrupt me too, just as much as men do. And, uh, but I was, um, uh, I, I married into a family 
where uh, everybody was was very uh, competitive and everybody wanted to get their opinion in there. And so I realized that um, by not saying anything, I was kind of getting trampled over because my voice wasn't being heard. And I had to kind of throw myself into the fray as well. And then um, I had a, a, a really interesting experience at a World Fantasy Conference uh, shortly after one of my books came out. And I was on a zombie panel because I'd written this uh, short story about zombies, which is one of my favorite things I've ever written, actually. <laughs> And uh, I was the only woman on the panel, and there were about, like, I think maybe 10 guys on it. And then I could not believe how um, uh, uh, everybody was, like, just jumping in after the questions were asked, and everybody wanted to get their say in. And, um, you know, as a woman, if, if you stand back and you do the thing where you kind of, like, hand over um, the limelight to, to, you know, other people, then you don't get to say your story. And, and not only that, but if you don't tell people who you are and, and what you stand for and where you come from, then um, what will happen is that other people will kind of fill in those blanks for you and they'll do it in a way that serves them and not you. So um, like one thing I like to say is tell your story before somebody else tells it to you because, or tells it for you, <laughs> <laughs> interesting slip there, because that is exactly what will happen. If you do not tell your story, if you do not put your version of things out there, then um, um, then other, uh, somebody else with a, a, a powerful agenda will come along and, um, you know, fit you into their story in a way that uh, could be very harmful to you. And as a culture, we, we have these default narratives. So we're, we're going to start, you know, we're, we're going to be very quick to make certain assumptions. And um, so to get back to your question, how do I interrupt things? How do I interrupt people? I will, um, uh, I will, Sometimes, sometimes there are times when um, I will talk over that person. If that person starts talking over me when I'm talking, I'll just raise my voice a little louder and I will talk over them and they will get the point and they will back off. And, um, or sometimes I'll just, I'll just say, you know, very politely, like, excuse me, but I just wanted to say this or you're interrupting me or, or, you know, and, and often when you do that, um, the man, if it is a man, um, will, uh, uh, you know, be very apologetic and will say, oh, I'm sorry, because, you know, people don't want to be rude. And I just think it's this thing where, um, I mean, I, the whole thing about male entitlement is, and I don't think men realize this because that's what it means to be entitled, is that you just kind of walk through the world and you assume that um, things are for you and about you. And so, I mean, like I'm, I'm struck by conversations I have with men when we talk about women dressing. They, they usually assume that women dress to please them and that when a woman is dressing sexy, she's dressing sexy because she wants to, you know, go out in public and she wants their attention. But that's not like women dress for all kinds of reasons and, and not all of them have to do with men. And even dressing like uh, um, in a, a central provocative way, I mean, that could be a woman just um, um, expressing um, some element of who she wants to be or, you know, because she likes the look or she likes the drama or she likes the impact or she feels, you know, she's proud of her body and she feels good in it. And she just wants to express that sensual aspect of herself and she would do it even if there were no men in the room. So it, it but that's kind of like a... Um, a strange concept for them. And I think it comes the same with conversation. I think, um, you know, men just, men just are, are, they're very easy in their right to speak and, uh, women less so. And so I think it just, you know, because they grow up and they're used to girls, um, and women, um, well, some of them, I shouldn't make such a sweeping generalization, but I, I think they're just, they're used to females being accommodating in one way or another. And, um, and they, they don't, you know, they don't realize when we're, we're kind of, you know, tamping ourselves down and then quietly feeling resentful about it. It's so, it's so great. It's so, it's just so true. And the thing you just brought up about the dress, I even think about, you know, in a past life when I did fitness work, yeah. how many women, you know, if women who have had babies and then they get their, they get back to a body that doesn't have a human growing in it. Sometimes yeah. it's just a friggin' celebration of making it to the other side. Yeah. Yeah, to feel like strong in your body yeah. after going through pregnancy. I mean, you know, I've I've been through it, and and when you start feeling, um, when you start feeling like like the mushiness is gone and you're vital again, and and uh, it's a, it's an incredible feeling, and you're really proud of yourself, damn it, because you've done this amazing thing. So, you've like pushed another human being out of your body. That's big. Yeah, and even someone who hasn't had a baby, but even maybe someone who's lost a bunch of weight and never has before, exactly. it's like it's almost yeah. like walking around in a new body and going, oh, I don't even. I don't even know what to do with this. You try things on, and that's that's so interesting. Yeah. The assumptions it's, people make. Yeah, it's enjoying it's enjoying the way that you know your body moves and your hips move. And uh, um, I mean, I used to wear I used to wear heels 
uh, in my younger and wilder days when I still like tended to dance on top of tables and things, but I wore heels that were like three and a half inches and, and um, occasionally even four inches. I never went higher than that, thank God. But um, I didn't wear them because they were, um, you know, uh, I didn't wear them because I was, I was you know, being uh, enslaved by the patriarchy and, and trying to please men. I wore them <laughs> because I liked the look um, and uh, I liked the way they made me feel. Like I, I liked, the, there was something about um, the way that you walk in high heels that uh, I really enjoyed mm-hmm. and I could do it very well. And it was just, um, it, was, it was just cool. And then um, I, I, I hit a point where it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. So now there are a lot of flats in my closet, but it's just, um, that was something, you know, clothes are fun. And when you enjoy adornment and fashion, and it, it's another form of self-expression yeah. and yeah. sensuality and sexuality. I mean, these are, um, these are, I, I think we forget this, but it's, it's sensuality is another language of self-expression. I mean, you know, who we, it's a part of who we are and, and you just want to kind of express that and not get punished for it. Yeah. I actually... Also, for anyone listening, more on this topic of adornment, I did an interview with, uh, do you know Christina Morassi? That name is familiar. You've probably just seen her in the world of, of online women entrepreneurs, but she, she she's all about that. She's all about the adornment. And, mm-hmm. and that was really cool because since moving out to California, I was like, wait a minute, I can literally just wear yoga pants and tank tops all the time. And any yeah. sense of style I might have ever had, which that was certainly <laughs> never a strong suit of mine, literally went out the window. Like, talk about yeah. not wearing heels anymore. I mean, I used to wear heels because I'm five foot two and three quarters, five foot three on a good day. And uh, it was just, it was cool to be in the land of adult sized humans. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, she talks a lot about adornment. So if anyone's into that or more curious, check out the interview. And, and in the show notes, I've, I've, I've referenced a lot of books and a lot of other episodes. So when you check out this episode, for sure, uh, go to the show notes, which are always at wildsoulmovement.com forward slash UW podcast. If you look for Justine's, because I don't know at the time of this recording what episode number this will be. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll be one of those super organized people that's like, welcome to the podcast. This is episode number <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm like, how do they know that already? But um, maybe they're doing it in real time. I digress. But yeah, adornment, Christina Morassi. So let me wrap this up before I go off on any more tangents because I can do it. Believe me. <laughs> so can I. I love asking people as well to wrap up, you know, under the title of Untame the Wild Soul Woman. One of the things I love, I appreciate and I love to demonstrate through these conversations is how many different flavors of wild there are. Yeah. Because it really just means your true nature or your current nature, right? Because that's always evolving, expanding, changing, pivoting. Anything I didn't ask you under this subject slash topic that you wish I would have or that you just want to share? Oh, um, <laughs> nothing really comes to mind. But I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm going back through our conversation and it's like zigged and zagged that I'm not even sure what we've said. So, um. I, uh, anything I'd like to say about claiming your wildness? You know, I think, oh, here's something. Um, I think as women, we get disconnected from each other in ways that we don't realize, and we get disconnected from our own history because, um, you know, history is, is uh, not written to celebrate us, and it's not written to celebrate our achievements. So um, one thing that I think tends to happen is that we miss out on uh, stories of amazing women from like 500 years ago or a thousand years ago or, or even 10 years ago or whatever. And, um, um, because nobody, you know, promotes those stories in the culture. And so we miss out on them. But one thing that these stories can do is that they can inspire us to like these bigger versions of ourselves. Because when you see somebody else do something amazing, then that makes you think, Oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it forces you to kind of start to reconsider what's possible for you. And so I would encourage, um, anybody listening to this, to really start looking out for um, stories of amazing, inspiring women, whether they lived today or they lived um, 10 years ago or they lived a thousand years ago, because these stories are out there. And uh, we really need to, um, I think part of claiming our wild soul as women is to claim our own history and to claim our own heroes. And I, w- I would love to see us you know, go out and really, really do that. Oh, I love that. And I'm only going to ask you this because I know you read so much. Any, any books that you've read particularly around women's stories that you love or that you would recommend? 
Oh, wow. Um, let's see. There's a number of books I'm trying to think of. Um, actually, I'm sorry. I'm just, it's, it's a, a lot of names come up. You know, there's one book that I really liked and uh, that I, I keep mentioning. Elaine Showalter, she's a professor of English literature, and she wrote a book called um, A Literature of Her Own. And she goes through, um, it's kind of like a history of women writers. And uh, so she takes, and, and most of these writers, um, because they were, um, they started out um, smart, talented, ambitious, but it's, it's uh, really sobering how many of these, these young writers, um, they, they, at some point they get, um, their ambition gets eroded or they get thwarted by, um, by housework, by childcare, by, um, you know, a husband who doesn't think that a woman's place is to write. So, so their ambition kind of gets distorted, but it's interesting to read all of these stories and, and to see how, um, you know, the way that we are today, you know, restless and ambitious and, you know, searching for greater meaning and, and all of that. And, and, um, and we don't want to be told what to do and how to be, we want to, you know, be recognized as human beings. Like it's, it's not like this consciousness has just suddenly um, emerged. It's like, it's, we've always been like this. And so I think when you reading um, this anthology of, of uh, these women's lives, these stories was, um, it was just, it made me look at even literature differently because it makes you realize that there, there is this kind of through line between, um, you know, art and stories and uh, longings and desires, and you can kind of like uh, trace it back through um, through work like this. And so I think what Elaine Showalter did was uh, really really cool. But that's a little more um, I think you know maybe a bit academic or esoteric, and that's me speaking as a writer. But um, you know, Christian female mystics. Uh, I'm kind yes. of getting into to those stories, and you know these women who were um, they. Uh, uh, they lived in convents, which meant they lived amid a community of women. They um, had access to uh, stories of, uh, you know, women from earlier on. And they did not, um, they were not responsible to husbands. They weren't raising kids. So, you know, they had this, this freedom and, um, to, to explore their inner lives and to engage in intellectual activity. And then they had the support of each other. So um, it's, it's some of these women who came out of these, these, uh, these situations are amazing. And I'm just starting to kind of get into them now. So I would, I would say check that out. Cool. Yeah, check I, out that shit. I picked up a book. It wasn't just females, but something with like sages, mystics, and something or other the other day. I don't even remember the title of it. But so great. Thank you so much. I know we did zigzag a lot, but th that's one of my favorite. When I interviewed um, Ali Shanti, and I asked her, what do you love about being a woman? One of the things she said was being consistently inconsistent. <laughs> and that gave me so much permission because I, I was like, oh, shit, that is, that's me all over the place. And so people who listen are totally used to that. So thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your mind, your heart, all your incredible knowledge, uh, the things that you've read, the things that you're creating and researching and everything. Always so fun and so stimulating to speak with you. So anyone who's listening, if you want more Justine in your life, it's justinemusk.com. And is there any anywhere else you want to point people or is that is that the home? That's the home. Cool. That's home. So again, thank you so much. Thank you everyone else for listening and we'll talk to you later. Thank you. When the moon is new, uh, it's when when it looks like kind of just like a thumbnail, right? So it's also called the dark moon because um, the moon is not super present. It's it's just like a little, little, little sliver of the moon is visible, which means the moon is not up there lighting up the sky. So that dark moon is also symbolic for us as a great time to go inward and to set intentions because, you know, the dark is kind of like a symbol similar to the season of winter, right? Like when it's darker for longer hours of the day, it's just a great time to be introspective and to reflect on what's going, in your going on in your life and set some new intentions.